Hey friends, I appreciate you for clicking play on this video. Actually, we have conversations about episodes like this. I bring in experts every single week in the Billion Dollar Brotherhood Facebook group that you can check out in the links below. Also, click subscribe. Make sure to hit a thumbs up on this video to get more videos like this. This is election day interview, and I'm excited to share it with you. You may be seeing this guest on London Real, Jocko's podcast, on Joe Rogan multiple times. He's a professional MMA fighter. He's also an amazing special force and has done crazy things all over the world. Welcome, my guest, Tim Kennedy. Tim, welcome to the BDB Podcast. Thanks for having me. Totally, dude. So I'm, I'm been excited about this. I just saw you on the Joe Rogan Podcast, which was interesting because we had just talked about that many of my friends knew who you were. Mm. I had maybe seen you, but didn't recognize it. You know, I wasn't like, this is the guy. Yeah. And then I started seeing you everywhere. We find out we live in the same freaking city over yep. here, which is an undisclosed location, especially right now. We're on election day. Real quick, what are your thoughts just freshly on an election day? What are you feeling? Uh, I have a, I don't know if it's unique, but I, I think any special operations guy that has pro- provided security on election days abroad, um, when you know we have 340 million people, and 200 million of them are going to come out and vote for during this election. Um, there's no shootings. There's no rioting. There's no, like there's going to be some sore losers, but like today on an election day, I, I've been in places where, you know, they were drilling people's hands to the wall, like taking a screw and drilling their hands so they couldn't go vote. And um, so like, we're just so blessed whatever side you vote for. It's like, it's pretty rad to watch 300 plus million people go out and cast a ballot on what their beliefs are. It's pretty, pretty special. And when you talk about that stuff, I always think of perspective. Cause I'm 28. I yeah. haven't gone overseas to go fight for something or freedoms. Yeah. I get to live and hopefully build this business to honor the freedom that I have. And I'm really big on that, but yeah. I haven't been someone who's gone out there and seen all these same things. And very often, how do you feel right now with the way that people are looking at America? Like, Oh, you know, there was someone who said, don't wear the vote sticker because yeah. there's people back in the day that couldn't vote. And they're stuck on all these small topics, but you're looking at this bigger picture of, do you understand that you get your freaking hands drilled in yeah. these other countries or you can't vote? You yeah. don't have the luxury and you, no matter what they own you, is that yeah. a weird perspective looking at what people focus on compared to your perspective? It is odd. Um, I look at them and I'm like, it's like a petulant child. You know, like I, I try not to, to be aloof, but I'm, I'm, I'm watching them bicker over the most inconsequential elements of this really complex nuance conversation that we're having nationally. And they're like arguing about a sticker or when does American history start? 1619, 1775, you know, and, and ultimately we have had this vision, you know, the founding fathers were like, hey, we're going we're, we're gonna to have this trajectory. And at no point have we met the vision of what the country was supposed to be, right? They, they had this beautiful idea and, and, and the documents specifically the constitution supported that and written by guys that own slaves in a period where blacks couldn't vote or women. And here we are in 2020 and by, by no means are we perfect, but like, look at how far we've come by far still we haven't met the vision of what we're is supposed to be, but we're, we're arguing over stickers or like a gender on a bathroom. How blessed and fortunate are we in this country where we can argue about what gender we're going to put on a bathroom. Those are really great first world problems. Great first world problems. And there's, and you've been through and seen these other issues that have gone on. I know that right after you or or right before, depending on the, the filming that, Kanye West was in Joe Rogan's studio. Yeah. And when I look at Kanye, and I, I'm an uneducated 28 year old, like meaning in this sector, I know how to build a business, I know how to sell things. That's what I'm really good at. How America runs or your life or what it's like overseas, not mine. So, preface for people that are wondering, yeah. I'm talking as the people that are watching that probably don't know that much about what's going on really. When I look at someone like Kanye, someone who's very innovative, I'd be scared personally. I like him. I love that he's a Christian. I love that he is very smart and that he has some ideas that blew my mind. I was like, did you end up seeing this interview at all? I don't know. Okay, so it was pretty cool. It was three hours, of course, and he goes all over the place. But the biggest thing that I saw was that there's this balance of innovation and conserving what we have and what we know. 
and I've always been afraid here in America that I'm like, what traditions do I, have? this isn't like the Chinese that have this 2000 year old tradition. Yeah. I'm like, I learned that like the forks go here and the spoons go here. Like that's all. Don't put your elbows on the table, put a napkin on your lap. Yeah. And when I look at someone like Kanye, let's say, cause we have Biden, Kanye, we got Trump and all these things that are literally hopefully going to figure out who wins things today. Yeah. There's this side of innovation, women voting, which is amazing, not having slaves and wanting to free other slaves from all over the world. There's still slavery today, which maybe we get into. And then there's the side of innovation that steps takes us away from founding fathers, what America's built on. What are your thoughts on like the balance of innovation and conserving constitution? Because there's one thing to throw everything out. Yeah. It's another thing to never change and grow as a nation. How yeah. do we do it right? So when you look at, I think, treat the Constitution as a kind of a living document and one that doesn't need to be interpreted because they, they had a great understanding of human nature, probably better than in any of us now. Um, but there's, there's a letter of the law and there's the intent and the spirit of the law. And the intent and spirit of those founding documents were to embolden the individual, to put the onus the responsibility and the power on the individual and the where individual responsibility, the individual, the people when, when they have the collectively the power they're they're supposed to be running everything. And, um, those cornerstone ideas have been intentionally buried and mocked and torn down. And, you know, you're like, you know, what, what are the, the elements of American culture that I, I, I have to attach myself to. Um, well, it's, it's in the constitution. And I think a lot of people t- really take it for granted. The, the fact that we have people out there voting right now and um, with freedom of speech and the right to bear arms. And um, I think we're not allowed. Somebody can't just kick in your door right now without due process that a soldier can't come in and be like, all right, it's election day. We don't know what's going to happen. So we're just going to take over your house. Um, those things don't happen the, the, And why it's because we, we have this very basic understanding of what are our rights as an American citizen. And, um, and they're, they're beautiful and they're powerful and, and we, we take them for granted that we, and, until you've been to the horrible places that I've been and seen all the horrible things that I've seen, you don't realize how good we have it and how, man, I'm not saying we're perfect. You know, like w- watching a police officer put his knee on the neck of a black guy that's saying, I can't breathe. Like that should never happen. Um, but like that happens every single day in most of the places that I go every day, all the time. Um, and, and it's not just like white on black and it's, um, it's like, different segments of Islam are killing each other. And you're just like, really? Can you guys just like get, relax a little bit? Yeah. yeah. But, um, like we, we are just, it's rad to be here. You're born in America. Like you hit the lottery, the lottery. Total. And most everyone knows that. Yeah. Right. Like people that come over from different countries or they, I even talk about with my wife and I, we <laughs> built our business together, not because we thought it'd be smart to yeah. do that. We just thought, how else are we supposed to do it? Two people working on it or one, probably two is going to be better. And it reminded me of like people that come over to this country that are like, they all of a sudden see all these things that we just are born with, that I've been born with as well, yeah. that I didn't, I didn't think about how we got it or how it's different than other countries. So before we even go there for some of the people that are new watching you, we were both born in California, kind of take me through the epitome of events that got you to where you're at today, yep. the companies that you run military, MMA. Let's kind of go through a little bit of that real quick and I'll be stopping you along the way. Uh, so born, born in California and my, my dad was a narcotics officer. So of note, he's, he's a brilliant, smart, um, powerful man that, um, at the time the war on drugs was kind of at its peak. So he was at the tip of the spear for that, you know, going and stealing pallets of, cocaine from Pablo Escobar, stealing a plane and bringing it to the United States. Um, and so I grew I grew up in like this crazy world of, you know, Lamborghinis and Porsches pulling in and suitcases full of cash. You know, my dad sometimes wearing a wife beater, like covered with stains growing, like trying to, trying to fake a belly. And, and this uh, cause are going in undercover. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. To try to go in and buy some, some drugs. And there may be some like conspiracies about this even right what people say like what, what do they do with all the drugs when people get confiscated people yeah. are afraid that oh did they just 
resell them back some you yeah know, sometimes like what what do they do with all these drugs <laughs> yeah um do they so, burn them, flush them down the toilet, so, throw yeah, them don't, in the ocean? Don't flush them down the toilet. Yeah, we, you, sometimes you destroy them when you're done using them. But let's say you, you, you come back from Costa Rica with a plane full of cocaine, with yeah. pallets of cocaine, and you know all of the distributors on, let's say, from Florida to California, from southeast to southwest. And you start distributing that coke to all of them. And then in one nice full swoop, you arrest all of the distributors in the whole entire southern portion of the United States. Um, but like you couldn't do that without Porsches and Lamborghinis and, and drugs. So um, while it was really difficult at the time to arrest Pablo Escobar, it wasn't a difficult to find the distributors here, distributors totally. to the street sellers. So trying to cut the head off the snake is impossible when that, that snake's head is in Colombia and Medellin. But um, you can definitely start hacking away at the majority of its body here in the States. So you grew up there. Your yep. dad was Porsche Lamborghini faking a gut. Yep. Keep going. Sometimes. And uh, went to college. And Which I, is difficult with your aesthetic, by the way. I mean, are yeah. you naturally this shredded all the time? I mean, I look at your stuff. You work hard, but I'm like, it must have been tough for your dad to fake a gut if he's got the Yeah, he's an athlete. Yeah, he... Um, he I wish he would get rid of that gut now as an old man, <laughs> but, um, hopefully he listens. Yeah. And I'm trying, I'll chip away at him. The, my, my brother also freak athlete, my dad, a freak athletes, all of our uncles were freak athletes. So yeah, it was not easy to, um, to not look, to look the part, but it's not hard to look like a meth head when you put a little effort into it. Yeah. yeah. You know, grow your hair out for a couple of months, get a, a shaggy beard for, you know, about five weeks and uh, put on a wife beater with some stains on it and some jeans that are torn up and some crappy flip flops here. You're pretty good go. So after a, a kind of crazy childhood, became a firefighter EMT. I did that through grad school. And um, while I was in grad school, I was fighting professionally and 9-11 happened. Um, I just finished the police academy and, you know, watched Americans decide if they're going to burn alive or jump to their death. So the falling man, I remember sitting there and watching the falling man was an iconic photo of, and you even post on your Instagram for people that want to go check it out. Yeah. Nine 11 this year, yeah. it's right now. It has the little thing over it. Like this is sensitive content, yeah. which it is, but it is, that was a yeah. motivate, motivate. You use something bad for good. So keep, if they want to check or bad out. for bad, I was just more effective at being bad than they were. You know, they, they, they scored 3000 kills in their little act on nine 11 and, we burnt their countries to the ground. You know, yeah. I don't know why people keep doing this. They're like, do you want, know let's go do Pearl Harbor. And we're like, okay, we're going to drop atomic bombs on you. Yeah, yeah. Like, Hey, let's go find some planes into some buildings. Like we will invade your country for 20 years. Like America has like a chip on its shoulder yeah. all the way from the beginning. It's like, Oh, we're going to tax you for a whole bunch of tea. And we're like, we're going to throw the tea in the Harbor cause you're being a jerk. And they're like, all right, well, we're going to have this little civil unrest and we're going to shoot somebody. And we're like, all right, well, we're going to kill every one of you that's still on this continent at some juncture. I hope the world learns that like, stop fucking with us. Yeah. You know, like we don't respond well. We're, we're, we're a bunch of immature. And, and right now for people that grew up in America that are just like, man, that sounds really hardcore, right? Yeah. Like think about it. we're in Texas right now. People can shoot guns, California. You can shoot guns, go hunt, but there's a lot more regulations. Yeah. And you get desensitized to real problems that go on in the world and and how you respond. For me, like that's kind of inspiring, like motivating. I'm like, when I listen to the uh, some patriotic songs, like I get choked up and excited because yeah. I'm like, dude, we're like the strong arm. Like this is good. Like someone has to rise up in power and kind of be the person that's like, don't mess with us. And it keeps everyone, what's the, you, you said it was bad for bad. Is there a balance of good with that? Are you inspired by that? Well, I, I hate the, um, you know, enlisted on, on 9-11 and I went over and did horrible things to evil people. Yeah. You know, like war is horrible. So like glorifying acts of war, you know, movies in Hollywood and, and hero this, or it's, it's just as, as somebody that has gone over and done those things, like it's it's disingenuous, you know, or we see the worst of, of humankind, you know, yeah. like the art of species, you want to see the worst, you go to war and like the things that a man can do to another man, it's, it's horrific. 
Um, you know, but for the greater good, I hate that argument. So that's why I, ex- I went over and did evil on our, our behalf. So yeah. we could, so we could kind of have this. Yeah. And you would never, you would choose not to, it's not like you'd rather not do it. I for even sure. think of a uh, operation underground railroad. Oh, you are, they free sex, tra- sex slaves and things like that. And I'm sure they would rather not get into these fights, not have to do that, not have to go, you know, beat these guys face in, which I'm not sure if they do, but I, you know, that's what you would want to do to these yeah. people. It'd be better not to have them. That'd be the best yeah. case scenario, but in a, in a place where there is wars, cause Let's sidetrack real quick. Right now we're on 9-11, 9/11 when you enlisted. But before we even go there, there's people right now all over the world that I've heard rumors of that want America to fail. Maybe there's a lot of them that lot of are them. planning, thinking uh, Middle Eastern countries I've heard. Uh, again, I'm going to talk broadly. So if I offend people, like that's my ignorance. Yeah. But I'll, I'll talk very specifically. You know, we, we have absolute enemies overseas that want to see us fail. Yeah. yeah. And... And if we just sit here and go, hey, like, we just don't want any problems, you know, and we just yeah. allow things to happen over and over again without standing up, then I'm assuming that things would go really, really bad. Can you shed some light on plots over in the world? Because right mm-hmm. now we're thinking about throwing bricks at our own freaking businesses yeah. and all this crap that we may see tonight, where there's other people that are sitting there with like, yes, yeah. like, Please this do is that. amazing. Please do that. Shed some light on this. Yeah, they're not just sitting there rubbing their hands. They're stoking the fires. They're, they're yeah. pre-positioning pallets of bricks, and they are funding insurgencies. Because they got lots of money to throw at this they to do. see us go Yeah, down. I think China has a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, China's absolute an enemy to us. We are in a proxy Cold War with China. There's, there's no splitting hairs about that. We have been at war with them for about 10 years. Um, Russia is a, a distant second string, but we are also at war with Russia. And we've been at war with Russia for 40 years. And uh, peaks and valleys of this war from you know the height of the Cold War to the Cuban Missile Crisis to proxy wars in Syria. I mean, that's very fairly recent. Funding ISIS, funding Iran. These, these are things that are very current day. And if at... And now, at 2020, on election day, November 3rd, they are 100%, no doubt, funding to destabilize our electoral process. To def- to, they, they don't need America um, to crumble. They just got to make it look bad. All they have to do is make democracy and, look like it doesn't work. But it's the only people work. that, it feels like we're the only ones that are looked at. It's almost like they're watching, looking for things we do wrong that they may do very wrong or even more extremely wrong. But it's like, oh... You see how America did this? Did you see that they didn't say things this way? Yeah. You see that they didn't do this, this, and they blow it up. Yeah. And But we're almost like this country that everyone's looking at, and it feels like everyone's just anticipating, looking for ways to poke holes in why yeah. we're failing. Yeah, you, like we, we, have, we have an asshole cop that put his knee on a, a black multiple-time felon, and the world erupts, right? all stoked by fire, stoked and charged by China's um, propaganda campaigns to make it this huge, what felt like this national, unbelievable problem that had to be solved immediately. But if you started like going into what these crazy accounts were, the outliers that were the most outspoken, that were the most um, fanatical, they're all foreign agents. This is not conspiracy stuff. If you go back to the 2016 election where it's, all right, there was some Russian interference, you know. Yeah, hell yeah, there was. You know, like, there's no doubt. And at 2016, they're like, okay, we're done. We're not going to interfere anymore. Yeah. Forget about it. No, of course not. They're like, hey, that worked really, really well. Let's go ahead and double down. You know, as a businessman, if if you're running Google ads and you're getting like 40% ROI, do you know what I'm going to do? Keep spending. Well, I'm gonna keep spending totally until it starts crumbling, and and their ROI, it's like millions for one dollar they spend because it's so effective to 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 fund insurgencies. You don't have to. I don't have to do anything to 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 employ a guy that can pretty much just write in English, open up a BLM page that matters, and um you know, prayer Christians for Christ. And, and have these two pages go and argue at each other all the time. And like all other people in that same space, and it's just one dude running a pro Biden account and a pro Trump account and a pro BLM account and a pro American flag account and a pro Kamala Harris account and a pro Dan Crenshaw account. And you're like, that's all one dude doing all those. Yeah. yeah. And he's doing it really effectively. 
And the reason I bring it up is because if we don't see it, everyone's just taking the bait. Yeah. And no one's thinking, oh, we've taken right, the bait. We're Americans. Yeah. Let's kind of come together. I even went to dinner the other night. I lost 1,700 followers in one day for saying that I voted for Trump. And I, I just said it because not because I told people that they should vote for Trump or why I voted for Trump or anything. I just said yeah. people vote and they don't, they're scared to tell people who they voted for. They don't want to hurt people's feelings or get rejected yeah. or lose business. And I just said, this is what I did so that you guys just know more about me. And if you hate me because of something I did, then you only liked me because you didn't know me. Yeah. And I'm like, that's pretty crappy. Yeah. And so I said this, but I also went to dinner with someone who's a Biden fan or they hated Trump and they voted for Biden. I don't know if they're a fan. And then a Trump fan, for sure. They were so afraid to go to dinner because they thought, oh, we totally disagree. You know, I think all lives matter and BLM's like a terrorist organization. The other one's like, but don't you understand what's going on? And they both had good points. We went to dinner, nothing happened. We had a great time. Almost everyone kind of agreed on everything, actually, yeah. when we talked about it. We had human connection, not one argument at all. It was wild. It's not wild. But we get, it, but, that's, that's the way but we get so for... divided with this like social media and yeah. like, these pages and people feeling like they take sides. Everyone thinks you voted for this person, so you believe everything. It's by design. Crazy. When you just sit down with somebody that you disagree with, and there's discourse, like really beautiful things happen, right? Like you have a different idea, I have a different idea. We sit down, we talk about our ideas, and those ideas, um, mine might have been flawed. And just talking to you, they go through the refiner, the refiner's process of of debate or even discourse, and that idea starts to to take shape and to mold and to change off of your input. Somebody that totally disagrees with me, but my idea was incomplete. But if that idea never meets that resistance, if that idea just sits in a vacuum, an echo chamber that's been curated and editorialized by your own page, right? Like, well, I'm not going to follow somebody that disagrees with me. I'm not going to subscribe to somebody that disagrees with me. I'm not going to listen to someone that disagrees with me. All you're going to have is these empty ideas that are echoing endlessly. And the only thing that comes out of that isolation is insanity. The only thing that comes out of isolation is like a unibomber or a psychopath. So any, anybody that thinks that their ideas, when you're protecting them from discourse, all you're doing is becoming crazier and more fanatical. At no point do your ideas have any merit. The only way that an idea can have merit is when it meets resistance. And that was the original intent of, de of debates. I don't know what the hell those debates were, but it was to take two diff different ideas, yeah. opposing ideas, and have them meet. And the public can sit there and be like, huh. Well, now it's not even ideas. It feels that what do we say to get people to want to choose us over yeah. this person? Because people say things and don't do it. I think that that was something that whether people know the facts or not, they liked about Trump. They said, this guy actually said something and did it. And I don't know fact checks and all the records on every single person and what Biden's done in 47 years and all these different things. But what I've saw was people say one thing just to get people to like it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's probably been happening in politics for a long time. You probably know better than me. But how do we even have that anymore if people think, well, what do Democrats believe? And I'm a Democrat and I need Democrats to vote for me because I'm not going to get Republicans yeah. to come and vote for me. So what do I need to say? Yeah, let, to let, get let me take a poll to hear what they want me to say. And I'm going to say those things. Yeah. What horrible, what, what a bad precedent this is. And, you know, it started about Carter and, uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin very wisely said the moment that um, you can buy your votes. I'm summarizing it, but when a politician can go and say, I'm going to give you these things and in return, you're going to give me your vote. Um, you've lost the process of a fair election because totally. now you have government that's like, what do the people want to, me to say and what do the people want me to give them? And I'll give them those things or I'll say I will. So then I in turn get their vote. Yeah. And then we're just in this endless process of. So do you think we have a fair election? Um, I think this is going to be a really rough election and I don't think it, we're going to know tonight, you know, um, I think for the amount of attempted meddling from every single foreign entity, from the Chinese to the Russians, um, to it's a bummer that some of these, both conservatives and Democrats progressive do it. Um, where they're trying to shape what happens in, in their kind of respective consist constituents areas where they're like, all right, we're going to get rid of these ballots or um, we're going to require yeah, fake, fake, fake places for people to put, to yeah. turn in their ballots. It, it's not, Stupid. it's 
it's so wrong. Yeah, you, you can't know? write, you can't beat someone by doing something wrong. Like you're doing something wrong in order to yeah, bin try Laden's, to do something right. It's Saddam really Hussein stupid. would do that. Yeah. You know, like how about we not do that? And that's something I think pretty much everyone listening probably agree with. That's yeah, when everybody looks to America, the most important thing is that our process of freedom is yeah. clear and it's defined. And you know, if I don't care if you go and vote for somebody I disagree with, yeah. as long as you do it right. Yeah. Right. And like the process is clear, like, yes, no on a proposition. There's yeah, no not, gray not area. Not taking there. 10 people's ballots and trying to vote on them yeah, and all like, this crap. Oh man, I don't agree with this one, so we're just going to throw that one away. And oh, there's a there's a Chad that's stuck on there. So yeah, and how, how do you know? The, especially the, with ride-ins or anything, how do you know people aren't like, well, you know, I could do for the greater good. Yeah. I could, you know, make sure that this happens because what I believe is correct. I think that's, uh, where do we get that moral conviction? I don't want to go too far down that, but it's it's almost like this, conviction of i just want to do the right thing they think they have the moral high ground to to interfere with the proper process of an election because they dis because they think that the other view is wrong so yeah. wrong that they have the moral high ground to say that that other view doesn't their vote doesn't matter so it's okay if i throw these in the dumpster yeah that's wrong did this happen that they found some people that had voted for yeah. Trump 2016? They found these ballots. Oh, it that, happened in 2020. So crazy. It's already happened. So, so what's the upside then for all these other countries? Because just to think about for a second, for someone who's learning from you, which I appreciate. Thank you for being here. You could be chilling out at the house or shooting guns or something like that. I don't know. Uh, if people haven't followed your YouTube channel and stuff like that, they'll see why I say those things. Yet, when I look at China and Russia, or even America becoming what, what people call the superpower. I would say we live in the best country in the world, which mm -hmm. is even a weird thing to say now. People are like, what? No, we don't. Like this country is jacked up. Just imagine for one second that a random country gets founded right now, and then all of a sudden becomes superpower. The fact that we even did that when there was established countries already is just the craziest thing to me. We must have done something right and really, really good. And maybe you know some stuff about that. What's the upside for these countries that are trying to watch us? Like a house divided among itself falling. Like that's what it seems like. We're, we're kind of doing like. it. That's what it feels like. It feels like. It's not what it is though. You know, if, if you if you walked downtown Austin and e even with who you voted for and finding somebody that disagreed with at, at one of the voting locations, could, you could just almost walk up to anybody and be like, hey, How's it going? Yeah. Um, Where do you like to eat? <laughs> yeah. We, we, so we disagree on this. Um, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Totally. And, and they'd go and do it, right? I, if somebody asked me, I'd be like, I would love to. I yeah. like coffee. I like discourse. Let's go talk. Yeah. Um, but on Twitter or, or Instagram or Parler or Facebook, I mean, it's intentionally divisive where yeah. you've never felt so further away from another American, but it's not the way it is. Yeah. You know, like I, I just got off the phone with with my cousin, and I mean she is profoundly different view and perspective from me on on nearly every single issue, and it was I love you, I miss you. When do I get to see you? Pretty crazy yeah. times we're living in. Are you safe? Are you healthy? You know, next time we see you, let let you know, like once all of this kind of blows over, let's sit down and talk. And and uh, I would love to better understand. Yeah, your view on some of these things. She knows I totally disagree with her on, on almost every single issue. But like, that's how it is with everybody. All of my, all of my friends that voted differently than me on on issues both regionally and nationally, we can still sit down and be like, "Hey, what's going on? I think that was a dumb idea that you voted for Proposition A. You know, like, that's going to raise your taxes quite a bit." Yeah. And do you vote for Proposition? we no. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well then we can continue this conversation. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Like if you're like, no, we did vote for it. I'm like, no, ah, we didn't. Well, that's pretty dumb. Cause that's going to raise your taxes a bit. And I like my money. I guess you don't, Yeah. but would it had changed anything? No, we would stay here and just keep talking. Right. Totally. I mean, maybe we're going to jab you a few, a few more times, but that's it. And you can't, there, there's a quote that they say that it's proven that you can't love something or someone more without understanding it more or them more physically impossible. And so, Without being able to do that, we'll never get to know people enough. And you can't fall deeper in love with someone or something without greater understanding of it. So we never get to have this connection even of 
disagreeing or whatever yeah. and get past that to be able to build a relationship. So I think it's cool for everyone to think about out there. Also put yourself in the other person's shoes. Someone disagrees with me. I'm like, cool. Like you went through a series of events in your life and thought processes that led you to that. And like, I'm not going to be like, why can't you see the same thing as me? Yeah. It's far different. I mean, I don't want to be in a world where everybody sees the same thing as I do. You know, yeah. that'd be a pretty, that'd be a pretty jaded world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Please yeah. have people that have not so, had these experiences. So with the other countries, what's the, what's their upside? Why They're, do they want to see America fall? Um, well, we're competition. We're, we're competition in the global market. So China and Russia, on a fundamental level, everything about how they operate, both economically um, and politically, is an inversion of us. right? So Putin gets to say he's president for as long as he wants i've heard he's like the richest person in the world as well he is he owns yeah, every it, business in i mean on, on paper it looks like he's maybe top 10 but if you start like peeling back layers and shell corporations every Crazy. single business in russia pays the piper pays putin every single one of them Isn't that crazy it, so keep going they're fundamentally different china you think that you can start a business in china um and like, man, I have the entrepreneurial spirit. I have this great idea. I have this great product. And I want to see this, this idea, this vision given to people. It's going to enrich their lives. It's going to make them better people. It's going to like freaking cure cancer. Trying to get a piece of it. Period. You don't get to do that. We, 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 I remember when Obama was running and, and he said, um, you didn't build that. We built that. And there was a lot of outlash from a lot of entrepreneurs who were like, no, no, dude, you did not help me build this business, Yeah. right? The, the taxes that I pay, the corporate taxes that I pay, the income tax that I pay, like that is me just giving you money. If anything, you, not only did you not help me build this, you directly interfered with my success. That's cool to be able to say those things. Yeah. Over there, not only do you not get to build it, the country gets to own some of your company. By some, I mean a lot. Yeah. All the books are transparent to the Chinese government. Every cent that you make, every every write off that you think is, I'm not going to um, pay taxes on this on on this profit because there was actually extra expenses. They're going to come in and be like, ooh, so we disagree with that. And um, not only do we want a portion of what was your write off, we also get an extra portion of. Uh, your profit. So just go and give that to us. And then you have the Middle East that we didn't talk about either, really. Oh, we don't even go down that road. Yeah, that be crazy. Because I've heard that they they try to infiltrate with the election and trying to get people in place. They yeah, they suck, though. Do like, you think Iran is, has, has, I mean, China has bot farms with hundreds of millions of followers. You know, like they, they, they can like one of their posts or they can create a post and they can have, have hundreds of thousands of people, people accounts go and like it and share it and comment on, on it. Or they go onto a YouTube um, post with something that they disagree with and they start reporting it and demoting it and going to YouTube and be like, you know, this is spam yeah, and false then, information. Oh, oh, automatically that thing just disappears instantly instantaneously like an entire idea is buried by a foreign government that's happening right now have you yeah. seen the social dilemma i haven't seen it yet oh you need to watch that is it really that good we just yeah. thought oh like we know social they, media is an echo chamber they just scratched the surface really yeah they don't even get into right like foreign interference For the people that did see it what's the things that they what's outside the surface what's so, so surface? in real time Everything that you say and do on social media is pretty much being tra transcribed, evaluated in an algorithm, and then depending on if it aligns with what they want, will be promoted or demoted. Yeah. So, like, if in the narrative of what we're saying right now, my words are being put into black and white. That black and white is in real time, word by word, letter by letter, is then being reviewed. And if they like what I'm saying, then that thing they promote and more people see it. If they don't like what I'm saying, that thing gets penalized and gets buried. Hashtags don't populate. Accounts get hidden. You you type in Tim Kennedy MMA and it just doesn't pop up. Yeah. You know, like I've 
900,000 followers. I'm a verified account. And, you and there's like in, someone with no profile picture. That's I'm three like a, pages down. Yeah. You're right. You're like, scroll, 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 scroll. There's nine different fake Tim Kennedy MMA accounts. So you're even saying this happens to you. Cause you're oh yeah, 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 no doubt. Like, there's no question. Because people don't like to talk about guns or what. I don't know. Whatever the narrative that they don't like. Self <laughs> defense. Like, I'm like a pro. Cooking food. I'm like a pro everything. Like, I love everything. You know. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I kind of like toe the line. Like, walk now. I stay in the gray. Yeah, yeah. And even I get. I mean, there was. You think you stay in the gray? I just came from California, so I'm like, you think <laughs> you stay in the gray? I think I do. Yeah. Cool. And they, uh, but yeah, they they hammer me all the time, and it's super clear. It, one day I'll just be like, Oh, I'm in the penalty box again. I will yeah. go from getting two to 3000 new followers a day to zero followers for three months That's so immediately. Weird. So then you go, do you use like Hootsuite or anything? Yeah. We've so, used it in the past. Okay. So now, um, Instagram, we'll just talk Instagram. For example, they limit how much data in your insights and analytics you have access to. You used to be able to see months and years of, of all yeah, of your yeah. cumulative data. Well, now you get a few days or some very specific posts and they're trying to encourage you to use money to promote your stuff. Um, but Hootsuite catalogs everything. So I would go in and I'd be like, all right, well, what happened where I went from you know gaining in 10 days 30,000 new followers to zero followers for 30 days. Like, this is interesting. And then overnight that happens. So we'll go in and we'll look. And whatever number of followers followed me in that day, the same number of people would unfollow me. My bottom 1% of my users or my followers would be automatically unfollowed. And they'd be writing me DMs like, hey man, I was following you, then I never saw your stuff, and I didn't know what happened. So I went to your page and I wasn't following you anymore. And I was like, huh? Magic. I don't know that. So the social dilemma, um, they just sit down numbers. Like th- th- this is just a, this is, I wouldn't even say it's, it's a show or a movie or a documentary. It is a review of the process. It's irrefutable. It's, you cannot argue that a bunch of people in Silicon Valley are sitting there dictating what people hear, see, and read. What's the outcome of this? Oh, that's a bad, that's a bad idea especially with Americans, yeah, right? You start taking that pendulum and you start throwing it in a specific direction and you throw it a little bit further. What happens with that pendulum? It comes back. It comes back with a little bit more energy, right? Yeah. So if you think that you can control that pendulum and be like, oh man, I'm, I'm just going to keep moving this. I don't want these people to hear this. I, don't, I, don't, I disagree with this. As I'm sitting here in my cubicle in Silicon Valley of California, yeah. being like, ah, oh, that guy in Idaho and Montana and Tennessee and Mississippi, he's just a racist bigot. Nobody needs to read what he, oh, he used hashtag patriot. All right. Nobody needs to see this. And they keep moving it. Anytime... You, you think, I mean, this is the current day equivalent of burning books. Yeah. Like how'd that go for the Germans? Not good. Not, went not, yeah. it went not good. Right. Yeah. They're just like, oh, we're going to burn some books and, and we're going to silence some, some people that we disagree with. And, um, and then everybody is going to come and stomp us into oblivion and we will only exist at their leisure. I mean, that's what happened in 1945 in April. We were like, Okay. So we're going to hang some of you. Some of you we're not going to hang as long as y'all be cool. If you're not cool, we're going to revisit this Nuremberg hanging thing. Are we all on the same page? So you don't get to burn no more Jews and um, you're going to play by these rules. We literally went and dictated how they're going to run the country for the next 60 years. Pretty crazy. That is insane. You said gray area. That's where you stand. Mm-hmm. Define kind of gray area because there's really you're super accepting which i think is really cool i think you even when you came in here you were like i don't care who you guys voted for because people voted today or early voting and i think that's really it's awesome even for people when i posted who i voted for just strictly again i didn't care i was just showing people a part of my life that they don't have any i don't owe them anything to tell them that but i just did it for fun for myself kind of i was like i don't want anyone to have anything that they can hold over me there was people that said, no, Biden, Biden, 2020, Biden. I'm like, dude, that's amazing. Uh, like, that's yeah, awesome. Good for you. So kind of defined gray area because yeah. when people think of gray, they think you really don't stand for anything. Yeah. That's that's what a gray area would be typically defined as. Yeah. What do you say you kind of walk that? Yeah, so ground? I equally value the white and the black. You know, like I'm a, if we're going to use the, color spectrum of the political parties. I'm a pretty purple dude. Yeah. You know, as like a libertarian, a constitutionalist, you know, I was like, man, you want to smoke weed? 
Yeah, yeah. Do that. Totally. You know, like, you can't work for me. Yeah. I'm a security consultant company in defensive tactics. I sell guns, you know, like, so that doesn't really work. So I have to drug test you if you're going to work for me. Lo siento mucho. Yeah. Right? But, like, the, when I, social issues, pretty progressive. Um, economic, pretty conservative. Um, governance, pretty progressive. Um, our foreign policy, pretty conservative. Um, like you could almost go issue to issue and I'm like bouncing off the walls. Got it. But the whole I thing, the whole idea of kind of like my position when I say I'm gray is I really understand the subtle nuance of all of these issues. And there's not just one solution. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about like black lives matter and, and they do matter and we want to 100%. see change. And yeah. if there's racism, systemic racism within departments, we absolutely have to address, address that. And if there's training issues, we should probably provide them with more training, Yeah. you know? And, um, but then I also call out things like defund the police. Like that's the dumbest idea ever. Yeah. You know, like if a school is failing and all the kids are, are dropping out, like, don't we, do what we should do with that problem. We should take the money away from the school. We should defund the school yeah. and that will probably garner better, better options and better solutions. No, that's the dumbest thing ever. Right? Like yeah. everybody's I mean, like, it's like also even in the company, you, the sales department's failing. You don't defund the sales department. Yeah. You're like, Oh, Guys, we're just not going to sell anymore. Well, it's like that now nah, that doesn't yeah, really Now work. we're out of business. Yeah, yeah, or you want to attract good teachers is what you're saying as well. Mm-hmm. And there's no way to fix it. Like, we can't just leave the problem. Like, you, no. we can't just say we're not going to have any more yeah, of these but, police. And we it, just had a sign here that said, enter at your own risk going. It was like a joke, I think, from the police department in Austin. There's like, enter at your own risk for the next 20 miles. We have limited protection. And I thought that was pretty kind of It wasn't cool. a joke. Well, I mean, it's yeah. still funny. Yeah. But like I looked at it and I said, dang, they actually played that card pretty good. Like yeah. that's, they're getting their point across. And I, I thought it was sad. I personally, I moved here into Oakland? this county. Oakland defunded the police by 50%. Do you know what ha- happened to homicides in the past three months? I don't know. Tell us. This it's is fruit, right? Judge a tree by its fruit. 100% increase in homicides. So crazy. It's not crazy. It's, it's, it's common sense. Yeah. Math. Like, <laughs> like we're going to take all security and stability off the street yeah. in this vacuum of no form of, of governance. What do you think is going to happen? The same yeah. thing that always happens when there's not security and stability, bad things. Yeah. You know, like we pull out of Northern Iraq, what goes in there? ISIS. ISIS goes in there. Like we created ISIS by creating a, a vacuum of no governance, no security, no stability. And they're like, ha, there's no Americans here. We get to do whatever we want. Well, what we want to do is really horrible things like murder, rape, and pillage. And we let that happen. And it's crazy that it's happening all over the place. Yeah. Like shed some light on these things that are going on in the world outside of America. I feel, I was just at the gun range the other day for a man to be at lessons and there was people there. It was really cool. It was their first time ever shooting ever. Mm, so cool. And and it was also cool because they maybe looked like they had never worked out a day in their life mm-hmm. ever. And there's things that we just don't do anymore. And I actually heard you talking about even recruiting for the military has been difficult because people just aren't doing the things that they used to do, like running at school. I mean, think about it. There's like, if you can do 20 push-ups at school, like you pass PE basically. Yeah. Or if you can't do push-ups, we won't make you do it because... We don't want you to feel bad for not being able to do push-ups. It's like, dog, I was 60 pounds overweight. I couldn't even do five push-ups. I once broke my tailbone almost because I tried to jump on a skateboard and I was so overweight that I couldn't jump and I fell out, fell on my tailbone, couldn't sit for seven months. But now I'm in a completely different situation Mm -hmm. because I was able to change that. What's, What's the deal with, like right now, inside of that, we're, we're born in a country where we don't have that much pressure. And we don't have to work out or protect ourselves or learn yeah. self-defense, we think. So what's what's going on in these other countries, the crazy things that you see happening? Because for you, you're like, well, oh, let's not get it. We, are, we all know about the Middle East. I'm like, eh, uh, no, nah, we, we don't. We don't yeah. hear anything about it. If anything, we're the jerks. Yeah, I, I like looking to like Kazakhstan and Israel, uh, places that are hard. And, and the people are hard. And they're hard because there's no other option for success besides hard work. Yeah. Like you will starve to death 
um, Kazakhstan specifically, and Israel, if they become complacent, then all of the countries that surround them that want to not exist will run over them and take the land that they think does not belong to the, to Israel. So f- since they became a nation in 46, um, they have had to have pure vigilance all the time. Like everybody serves, everybody has a gun, everybody works, everybody's fit, everybody's prepared. And if you were to invade Israel, you have to fight everyone. Yeah. Everyone. Like the 14 year old girl over there, you're going to have a tough go with her. That 90 year old dude over there, he's going to be a problem, you know, and everything in between because everyone bought into the, to the process of pain and suffering. Freedom can only be accomplished through discipline and hard work. Yeah. With everybody bought in on this, they just have this beautiful, hard culture. We have this cycle in the United States where like good times make weak men. Yeah. Yeah. You know, weak men make hard times, hard times make hard men. Hard men make good times. Good times make weak men. And that cycle totally. continues, right? And you can look from American history after World War II, the greatest generation steps up and kicks fascists in the ass. Real Antifa fighters, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where like my grandpa went over there and was like, ah, you guys are assholes. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have to kill all of you. And then the fifties were just such a beautiful time. Baby boomers, like the success of, of American industry. And then sixties and seventies come around with Vietnam and civil rights. And yes, there was progress and yes, some really great things happened, but those, the weak generation from the forties and fifties now in the seventies and eighties made good times and good times made weak men. And then weak men made hard times. And here we are again, where I think for a couple of generations, they have had it really, really good. Totally. A little tiny percent percentage of Americans have gone overseas to do the fighting. So we didn't have to do the fighting here. I mean, 2001 was the last, 19 years ago was the last time that we had like fighting here. Yep. And um, that's 19 years of, of complacency. And that's 19 years of, of obesity and diabetes and, you know, McDonald's and sugar and, um, entitlement and, um, that creates what we're experiencing right now. And that's is, what I like about your message is that it's the ability to push yourself in good times. Cause you've been consistent for a long time. The fact that you even still do anything with the military and aren't just retired doing running businesses and whatever is dumbfounding to me. The fact that you swing kettlebells as much as you do, I'm like, this is dumbfounding. Like you don't need to do this anymore. You know this, right? Like you could go just run the businesses and go sit on your land and do, you don't have to do that. You actually made a post a while back. I think you said something around, just wait until the people that just want to be left alone step in or something like this. Yeah. And you could just be that guy, you know, sitting on his porch, retired, fine. And you've still weaponized and pushed yourself even when you could be comfortable. Like you have the opportunity to do that now. I've been super impressed by that for people that are listening right now that are you know, comfy you know, what's the point of being in shape? I don't really have to worry about anything. What's the point of learning how to protect myself, self-defense, home defense? Why should I do this? Because they just feel there's an illusion of safety and there's an illusion of there's yeah. no reason for it. I think the self-sufficient, self-reliant, individual responsibility, it sounds like a lot of work. You're like, man, do I, self-reliant, what does that mean? Does that mean I have to like grow my own food and like hunt my old stuff and like gut animals and stuff. It's like, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe it depends on the person. <laughs> yeah. But you know, at no point in this pandemic or this civil unrest were my teenage daughters or my little kids worried. Not once, not one time were they like, what is happening? I'm scared. Not one time was there a moment of concern. They just knew that things were good. Yeah. And that was because of constant vigilance and, and I am not brilliant. I am, I am, I argue like, um, you're, I, you're pretty freaking smart, but I, I argue that I'm always just this hairy ogre scarred hand chunked up dude. Yeah. And, but the success in all of these different realms, because I'm always searching and seeking to be uncomfortable and to be outside mm-hmm. of complacency kills and it kills everything. 
when I was going, um, we're, we're hunting Zarqawi. He was the, Bin Laden was number one. Zarqawi was number two. The movie, the movie American Sniper with Chris Kyle. Yeah. They were, they were, they were searching for Zarqawi's henchmen. The, fo- the photo of the Americans hanging from the bridge after they'd been burnt alive. Um, that was Zarqawi. That big fat Arab looking dude with the beard holding the American rifle standing on the dead bodies of Americans. That was Zarqawi. So I was, I was, I was blessed to be part of the task force that hunted and found him. And my team sergeant, John McPhee, the sheriff of Baghdad, a, a man of great note, you know, he dealt a force guy, um, in coming back from a mission, you know, I have blood on me and, and all other disgusting things that can come from a gunfight and putting my gear back up. And, um, he's like, all right, top off your magazines, change all your batteries, uh, make sure all the fills on the radios are current. You know, all the things that like, this, we just got back. I'm like, I'm going to have to do this again before we go out the next time. He's like, but you don't know when you're going to have to go out the next time. Mm. So do them now. And the fact that we had just had to have this conversation again, that's complacency, Kennedy. Complacency will get you killed. More importantly, it'll get us killed. Yeah, yeah. And you will fail at every single thing that you ever try and do because you're complacent. And that's because I just want to be comfortable. Man, I just want to have a few extra minutes to like, you know, at the time, um, I don't remember what the video, um, if like for me to call home and talk to my wife, you know, we had to use a, a anodated system like, hey, um, but complacency, both in your personal life, in your sex life, in business, like it kills it. It destroys it. If you just want to be comfortable, man, like go to Canada, you know, or go to Russia because they'll take care of you. But here we, we were people that carved our existence out of the wilderness. Like we fought bears and the natives, you know, and then we fought the British and then ultimately we were like, all right, things are getting pretty rad. You know, like yeah. I got some land. I got like nine kids running around. We're not going to starve to death this winter. This is pretty cool. But the only way there's, they literally carved what we have now out of a, a wilderness. And do you think they were ever comfortable? Not once. Not one time was somebody sitting there being like, I'm going to just kick my feet up by the fire today. I'm not going to go out and, and till the field. I'm not going to harvest. I'm not going to work. Yeah. No, I'm going to go break my back until my hands look like this. And then I know maybe my kids might have it a little bit better than me. Maybe. And it's almost honoring. When you talk about stuff like this, it's almost like it's an honor. When I talked about the beginning of the podcast, I said, I haven't gone out and fought in wars. But the reason I'm motivated to build my business and the thing that we tell our guys is, what are people going to say when I'm dead and I have to talk to someone? They're like, Hey, like I, I bought, we helped buy your freedom. Like, what'd you do? I'm like, uh, I sat in my home and like live with my parents because we didn't have, I didn't have to go out there and yeah. do anything. I don't know. Nothing. They'd be like, you mean I fought for, for you to yeah. do what? Almost like a honoring to go out there yeah. and do something. On Memorial day, which is a super tough day for me. Um, I always just say when people ask like, I used to like try to write people's names down of all my friends I lost. And, and 2010 was the last time I was successfully able to do it. Like I just lost so many friends, so many funerals that like, wow, I just couldn't do it any, like literally sitting there writing down names and couldn't remember all of the guys that in five years that, that I had lost. So now, now on Memorial day, it's like earn it. Go make their sacrifice worth it. Go deserve what they did for you. And it's like some of those were not easy deaths. Like some of those guys and gals that got blown up and slowly bled out as they're being transported and jacked up with morphine and being flown to Germany as most of their bodies burnt to a crisp and they're fighting and struggling for one more breath and they finally expire 14 days later. Like it's not like, the lights are out. That's not how it is. Like, what did you deserve? What have you done to deserve that? Go earn it. That's crazy, man. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. And for the people out there that are, you know, reaping the benefits of sacrifice, every are bought, election day. For. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Awesome. Yeah. It's election. Go day. vote. Yeah. And the going back to why you enlisted in the first place, you got, motivated and then you said kind of a negative way 
kind of walk me through the transformation of that because you had some fighting skills. Yeah. It, but it is tough for you. It's interesting for me because I'm always like, what's the what motivation for you to consistently still be serving and doing all these things? You know what I mean? Yeah. So walk me through that journey since I kind of cut you off on all these rabbit trails and tangents. Yeah. You saw me throwing my, my gi on the back of my truck. If you walk out there and look at it right now, it's covered in blood. If I stuck my finger up my nose right now, I pull out just like chunked dried portions of, of blood that's stuck up in my sinuses. That was for me training from one to two. And that's why I was late. I'm sorry. Um, this morning at sunrise, I did the army combat fitness test. This brand new, um, we were like one of the first units here in Texas to, to try and do it. And it was, it, it was really hard. Um, and I think I'm, a, I fancy myself an, an athlete, but I had my worst two mile time in 17 years in special forces today after doing these other five events from a max deadlift to max pull-ups to max push-ups to this um, fastest time shuttle run. And then you go out and run two miles. I'm missing a couple other exercises. Um, and uh, the why is to be uncomfortable. But going going back to the genesis of, of, of me kind of going down this path, I was top 10 in the world for fighting. I was fighting out of the pit with Chuck Liddell. And um, there was a period of time where I had a few girls pregnant at the same time. And I had just had a orgy of foursome with a bunch of ring girls after a fight. And one of those girls came back to the gym and told me that she had tested positive for HIV. So I have a bunch of girls pregnant and I might have AIDS. And, um, I had been afforded every opportunity to succeed. My brother and sister are just remarkable, incredible humans. And they, they took the right path. Then, then there was me who I, when I say I'm, I'm not smart cause there's a lot of living. Most of, most of my, the things that I've learned have been learned from mistakes. Um, I walk out into the Pacific ocean of Morro Bay, California, and thank God there was a lady with binoculars that watched me take off my shirt and my pants and my underwear and walk out into the, the ocean, start swimming out into the fog. So she calls the coast, the coast guard and the fog rolls in. And, uh, once the fog rolled in, I didn't know which way the shore was. And, uh, I'm listening for the sound of the waves crashing on the shore, but I've been swimming for 30 minutes for me. That was probably a mile and a half. So I'm a mile and a half out and I don't know which way shore is and I'm in the middle of fog. So my pecker is like, you know, pretty much inverted inside of me. Yeah. And this coast guard boat comes up and, uh, the captain legs hanging off the side on the front, drinking a cup of coffee. What are you doing down there? I'm like, uh, I'm swimming. I swim, uh, went for a swim. He's like, ah, how's your day going? I'm like, I've had a pretty rough day. He's like, you want to tell me about it? I'm like, yeah, I'll tell you about it. So I give him a brief summary, the executive summary of, of what this past few months had looked like. And he's like, I was going to offer to pluck you out, but I'm, if I were you, I might just stay in there. I'm like, yeah, uh, so I'd like to get out or maybe point me toward shore. And, uh, and the water's pretty cold. And he leans forward with this warm cup of coffee. And he's like, I, I can see that. I'm like, you're a, you're a dick. Yeah. He's like, well, I might be one, but you don't have one. Yeah. So he comes and uh, they, they pull me up on the boat. And they throw this, this rough wool blanket on me. And that was not yet bottom for me. Um, Rex Krebs was a serial killer in California. And he had been raping and murdering women and burying them in his backyard in 50-gallon drums. And uh, I was working downtown San Luis Obispo. And uh, I'd walk girls home after um, the bars were closed. And, and I remember, like, you could almost smell the fear where these girls were like, I just want to be out. I want to be with my friends. But there's three of us. Is three of us enough to be able to walk home without being kidnapped and raped till we die? You're like, nobody knew. And at the time, that was like the worst form of evil you know, from, from Dahmer and, you know, Silence of the Lambs for like all serial killers up, up to Rex Krebs. Like th that was, I think how every American viewed what pure evil looked like, mm -hmm. like Mala and Say, just pure unadulterated evil. And then I watched Americans 
3,000 of them have to decide whether they're going to jump to their death or be burnt alive. And that is like, there's a different kind of evil out there. And um, I don't deserve the air I'm breathing. I have, I, have, I have wasted every moment of my life up to this moment. What am I going to do now? So I weaponized that shame and, um, and joined special forces. And um, that started the journey of you know, going to infantry school and then from infantry school to airborne and then to a special operations preparation course and then selection. I was fortunate to get selected. And then you go into this two-year long pipeline to become a Green Beret. And then once you get your Green Beret, you go to these other teams, these specialty teams. And when you get there, you have about another two or three years of you know nothing. And now we're going to show you what you need to know to actually be part of this unit. Just about a four to five year pipeline of just being competent enough to not get everyone around you killed. And this was at the peak of the war, so Iraq and Afghanistan, and we still, even though we were we were taking rotations overseas, we still had to work in our respective AOs. So for seventh group, I still had to go to South America and and you know do do J sets and FID and. Um, security for all of our partner nations down in South America. And then also do the career progression of going to ranger school and going to sniper school and going to Sephardic and going to driving schools. And so you still, you had these, um, this cycle annually where like I, uh, you'll hit a school, you'll hit a J set, you prep for a combat, you go to combat, you come back from combat, you go to a school, you, um, start prepping for combat, you go to combat. And that's like the, until you die. And you still fought a little bit during that time too, right? Yeah, I think I fought 15 times um, professionally, you know, going to the UFC and f- fighting for the Strike Force World titles and, you know, beating Michael Bisbing and Robbie Lawler and Hodger yeah. Gracie. And- yeah, and people can check out those fights. They're still, and I watched one the other night. I was like, this is cool. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's pretty intense. You're a good fighter. I, I was all right. I was, I was good at violence. Yeah. You know, so like that carried over into all the things I do. And you said something, you talked about going to all these different places. You said something that like I had never heard of before that I heard you say the other day. And you talked about some Nazis somehow fleeing. Is it, is this like common knowledge that everyone That's knows about? Knowledge. And everyone's like, oh, there's all these like people over here in these different countries for the people yeah. that don't know. I never heard this before. It makes sense. It's like, yeah. well, like we're kind of done. We probably should run. Yeah. So when the war started going bad, yeah, you had the true believers that were like, we're going to go down with the ship. And then you had the real pricks, the total assholes that like guys like Mengele, Mengele was a doctor um, that worked for Hitler. And he would like take blue ink and inject it into Jews eyes to see if they could change the color of the brown eyes to blue eyes. Yeah. And he would take twins and he would torture tw- uh, one twin to see if the other twin could feel the pain, you know, and, and like every horror movie, about what the Nazis did. How the heck do these people do this? Well, even more gross was that that guy escaped. He wasn't a true believer. He was a serial killer that was capitalizing on the moment of being in a world war and having yeah. access to, to limitless people to do all of his disgusting things to. Well, he was not special. He's a dime a dozen. There were hundreds and thousands of people like him. So when the war started going bad for the Nazis, they're like, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to leave here because we got the Russians one way, the allies the other way, and we're stuck in the middle here and we're going to lose. So they had created these rat lines to get out of Germany. And one of them went to North Africa. One of them went to the Middle East. And then one of them went to the Americas, South America, North America. Some of the guys we took willingly in Operation Paperclip, where we knew we were after World War II, we were going to have to fight the Russians and it was going to be an arms race. So the best and brightest minds from Germany, both in the concentration camps, because some of them were Jew scientists and some of them were German Nazi scientists. We did not, we did not distinguish between the two. They were just scientists. So we wanted them because they, most of NASA in the fifties and sixties, the, the, the best and brightest minds were repatriated Nazis or rescued Jew scientists. So that was Operation Paperclip, different part of that was us as an American government 
just taking these people. You can just Google Operation Paperclip. It's pretty frightening. But greater good, right? We're fighting the next thing, which is um, communism. The guys that we didn't acknowledge or knowingly allow fled to South America, mostly to Argentina, um, the largest population of fascist, card-carrying fascist, card-carrying Nazis were in Chile and Argentina. And the presidents of both were Nazis. Like, I'm a Nazi. Here's my swastika card. Come on down. So they were, had the war gone a different way and we st- maybe started losing the allies and the Germans started being successful. They already had a foothold in South America. They weren't going to try to come across the Atlantic. All right. Like set up base in great Britain once they got there and then like started flying bombs over. No, it would have been a really tough, difficult invasion to come to the United States. Yeah. But if they had a foothold in South America and then those ideas of the Fourth Reich were able to spread. So that even early on in the war, in the late 30s, they were already positioning um, elements in South America. So when the war started going bad, those people just flooded down there. I mean, you can go to areas like Bariloche in Argentina, and they are exclusively speaking German in a bunch of pockets. And you go into Cordoba, um, you know, the the tri-border region of um, the Misiones up in northern Argentina. Totally German. Blue eyes, blonde hair, you know, good night, good morning. You know, like, what? Buenos dias? Yeah. You know, what's going on right now? You know? Um, and then some places, Colonia Dignidad, for instance, in, in southern Chile, like it was a commune. It was a huge community that they carved out of the woods that was funded by Nazis and a h- bunch of Nazis that escaped from Nuremberg and that left Germany, never went to the trials, even though they were tried in absence. So they were able to escape and live in the, the jungles and mountains of Chile and Argentina. And um, they, were, they were hunted. They knew they were going to be hunted by the CIA and by the Mossad. Um, and there were not government agencies of Israel, like the Ergun, who were just flat out hunting them. Like this wasn't like, this is our mission. This is, this yeah. is we're going to find Nazis and we're going to skin them. And uh, they were more of a terrorist wing of, anyways, different yeah. story. So these places absolutely exist and existed and they exist today. Yeah. And uh, so on the show Hunting Hitler, while the story we were talking about could have Hitler gotten away. And that was the story yeah. that we covered. But the way that we did it was we fo- followed all of the rat lines of how does a Nazi escape Germany and which ones escaped Germany from Martin Bornemann to Joseph Mengele to um, Schweitzer to like the list goes on and on. Uh, Skorzenski, bad, bad, bad dudes that escaped. I mean, they they... successfully and efficiently and effectively did a genocide that we haven't seen except from the Russian and Chinese um, in modern memory. And they just survived and existed. Adolf Eichmann. And not this crazy though? Because we talk a lot about bad guys for the most part. That's what we've been talking about. I'm sure there's good guys out there as well. Lots of good guys. Lots of good guys. And... Even when I'm thinking about this, though, I'm thinking, well, if these guys, one, what's their motivation? Is it like power? Yeah. Is this like, are they, are they, or are they like brainwashed? And they're like, they those think those things are mutually exclusive. Devil? Got it. So you can have power, and you can also be brainwashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like ultimately, they want influence. Yeah. And good or bad influence. In this case, you know, I don't think anybody would disagree that Hitler was a very influential person. Totally. Right. Mao a very influential person, regardless of what you think about what they did. They were one of the most influential people to, to, to have lived. Genghis Khan, pretty influential. Totally. Um, sometimes it's by their, their brutality. Sometimes it's by their ability to communicate, to lead, to inspire. Um, Winston Churchill, so influential. Yep. You know, um, was he a Genghis Khan? No, no, but he was without him. We would have lost the war. Well, these talents are like, if you build a business, it's like marketing, but marketing can be used for good or bad. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of just like whoever puts on the, you know, guns can yeah. be used for 
something that's bad or not for something yeah, that's they can bad. Preserve and protect human life or they can equally take good life. Totally. But it's like the, there's that whole battle of like our guns bad. Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, I don't know. The gun just sits there. You know, yeah. it's like if you hit someone with a car, cars aren't bad, but if you hit them on purpose, then that's the person driving. It's probably an asshole. Yeah. So what, wouldn't there be like some type of fear of like these conspirers of all these freaking bad people, like these Germans that they let live that are jerks and really rude, bad people yeah. for like the nicest way to say it. And then wouldn't they call up Russia and be like, Hey, like we're down here and chilling. Like, well, fortunately fascists and, and communists hate each other because their ideas are opposing. Um, so that's good. Yeah. Like, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Close one. That was a good one. I mean, but for, for evil to conquer, what does it take? good men to do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about good, um, bad men, but let's, let's not miss the fact that we had people climb cliffs during the invasion that jumped out of airplanes for the first time in modern warfare behind enemy lines that we had the greatest generation that looked into the face of fascism and were like, not today, motherfucker. You know, like we had the Chris Kyle's of this war. We had the Audie Murphy's of that war. Right. We, we have had more heroes than I can name in the Medal of Honor recipients to Silver Star recipients to every single private that stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima. Like those are heroes. And all it took was them to be like, evil will not conquer today. And even now, as we're in these kind of uncertain times where, you know, you have Antifa burning down buildings and you have um, white supremacists walking down with tiki torches and polo shirts, like all it takes is good people to be like, no, man, you're stupid. Yeah. That's a dumb idea. Go put your tiki torch in the, in the pool and go home and, or I'm going to knock your face in. Yeah. Similarly, like if you pick that brick up, you're going to go in cuffs after I pepper spray you and you're going to be going to the back of the police car with your hands behind your back as you're like suffocating on your own snot and vomit. Cause it's really cool. And you have pepper spray in your face. And, um, and because I'm a good person and I'm not going to allow you to destroy that person's business and their way of putting food on their family's table just because you don't like what somebody said one time in politics. And people think that, well, I can go and vote, but you know, this isn't my, I'm a business guy. You know, I, this isn't my fight. I don't need to say anything. Keep this away. You know, I got told, even my dad yelled at me, the other, you said what about this thing? Or you're talking about this? Or you're doing these podcasts? What's the, what, you know, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to really, you know, mind your own business. Yeah. There's many people out there that think, well, like you're a military guy. You know, you're, this is what you do. But I, you know, I'm not going to speak up or I'm not really going to say anything. What's something that they can really do? You know, like what, what do you say to them? You go to pick up your kid from school, right? They're in second grade. And um, you're sitting there waiting in line, and you see a guy in a black trench coat kind of sweating, and he's angry, you know, and he's pacing back and forth. And he walks up, and the principal walks out and confronts him. And he's like, no, blah, 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 blah. but you don't know what's going on. You're sitting in your car. You're just waiting for your kid. Right? And you see that person walk out to their car, open their truck, pull out a machete, and a shotgun. What are you going to do? What would you do? I'd murder them. I'd kill that person. Yeah. Right? Like, the, I mean, like, all right, so I'm sorry, but you don't yeah. get to go shoot kids or like chop them up with a machete. Sorry, that's not really an option today. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, it, it, that, that famous saying of for evil to conquer, it just takes good men to do nothing. I'm not saying you have to be a Karen and be walking down the street and be like, Hey, you're not wearing your mask today. You know, yeah. like you need to really get out there and, and make sure that you're not spreading that global pandemic. Cause this is real. That's all I'm saying. What I'm saying is you at some point have to stand for something. Yeah. And you have to know that your belief is rooted in truth. And if your position Regardless, I don't think from a Biden to a Trump supporter sitting in that car wanting to pick up their kids, watching that guy walk in there and be like, meh, whatever that guy's going to do is okay. Hell no. Go stop that guy. Yeah. And metaphorically put that into every single bad thing that could happen in this country. Why would you sit there? Because you're complicit if you're allowing that to happen. But the only way that you can be prepared for that is here we are, full circle, individual responsibility. Self-reliance, being hard, having scarred, chunky hands, a back that's sore from work, where there's not even a moment of hesitation. It's like, nah, 
Not my kid's school. Not today. And sure as shit, not my kid. And what's the quote that they say? Sweat more like in good times and then that way you bleed less in battle. You yeah. remember this quote? Like yeah. we could probably Google it and throw it up for people. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a Spartan motto. Yeah, it's like you, if you sweat, the more you, that you sweat, when, the less that you bleed. The less that you bleed in battle. And I was like, man, like this, this makes sense prepared. Yeah. But some people would be afraid to maybe stand up because they don't know how to guard themselves. I remember we did a CQD training, like close quarter defense training with a bunch of our guys and the confidence that they had if they got into a situation, which by the way, like the number one thing we learned from that is that if the situation isn't going to affect you and you can leave, you leave. You don't just go like fight people. Yeah. And there was tons of examples of people that knew how to fight that died because they chose to fight when they could leave because they got triggered or usually it had to do with alcohol, like yeah. something with alcohol. That was usually the thing. <laughs> Yet, what are some of the things, I know that you, even some of your companies train or teach some of these ideals and things like this. What are things that people could do to get more familiar with being prepared Mm-hmm. Not because they want to battle, but so that they can stand up and get to know America better, get to know themselves better, take responsibility, and even protect themselves. Yeah, I, I think it, it, the first is, and I'm asking for a leap here, is is faith and belief that at the far end of all this hard work is a reward. I'm not putting a carrot out there being like, hey, things are going to get good. But man, like, I put all this work in. I sweat, I struggle, I bleed. And like, my sex life is pretty rad. Like, it, it would suck if I was fat, I drank, not getting good sleep, yeah, yeah. right? Libido's in the toilet. Wife walks in, I was like, you yeah, know, I mean, you look good, but you know, I'm tired. I had a long yeah. day at work. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Right? If my son is like, hey, I want to go lay, play lacrosse, um, whoever gets the ball first, who wins this first race? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get the ball first. So I'm sure, I'm sure as heck going to beat you in this, this little foot sprint that we're going to do five-year-old yeah, <laughs> amateur, you know, um, on the far end of like from business success to sleep to how good food tastes, like food tastes better. Like, um, I probably burnt 4,000 calories before I had my first, first meal this morning. Cause I fasted this morning and, um, I had uh, a couple of tacos from Papalote, which is really good. I rec- highly recommend it. I'll and, it. Uh, and a cappuccino right before I came here. It was the best thing I've ever tasted yeah, in my yeah. life. Food tastes good after that. You know, uh, yeah. After like 4,000 calorie deficit, two hard workouts, um, uh, a, a short fast, man, like it tasted so good, but that's how it is with everything. Like business is easier. Leadership is easier. Like the relationship with my family and my kids is easier. Like the influence that I'm able to pass on is easier. You know, you, you can have positional authority where I can sit here and be like, I'm the boss. You guys need to listen to me. Like if you have to say you're the boss, you have to listen to me, you are not leading and you're not the boss. Totally. Right. But if you have moral authority where people are looking to you and be like, I want to follow that person. I want to do what that person is telling me to do because I know it's the best thing for me. Like that's moral authority where they, they, they're, they're looking at not just my perspective, but how I do things. They know I'm the first one there. I'm the last one to leave. They know I'm going to work harder and more effectively and more efficiently. They know that, that, that I'm going to pour everything of myself into the things that I do. There's, there's not a gray area. There's not a lukewarm. Totally. Like, do you want to drink coffee? That's like 84 degrees. Yeah. That's not disgusting. Too. Yeah. Do you want to drink champagne? That's at 80 degrees. No, you want it at 34 degrees, right? Like that's what you want because you want it to be right. Like yeah. no, not, I don't want lukewarm. I want fucking rad. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming in first off. A pleasure. Election day. Mm-hmm. For some of the people listening, the, you know, now it's too late. Probably everyone's going out and voting and doing all Better these things, voted. which is awesome. Better voted. And I didn't vote the first time I could, I think. I'm 28, so that would have been, I voted when I was 24, but not when I was 20, I believe. And... So even for me, I just didn't know. You know. I was like, I don't know. No one talks about it. No one really talks about these issues. No one really educated me on why I should be proud to be an American and yeah. why I'm blessed to be an American and be in America. So for the people that are leaving here, though, and they're going, all right, what, what, what can I do to be a better American yeah. and, and walk in the identity of an American? Because there's these progressive ideas and and ways that we think we should do life influenced by all these countries and people that want to control us. And then there's the conservative side of nothing ever changes, which means that we'd still be 
wearing freaking you know old clothes that never innovated yeah. or something we don't want that what can they do leaving it as an american saying i want to be a better american i want to yeah. unite america i want to be a part of this movement and the greatest country in the world and keep it great yep what do they do get out of your comfort zone find people that disagree with you and then get involved in the process you know, i wish i remember growing up the first time i voted it was like get informed and vote well now you can't get informed really because everything that you see and you read on every single device is so partisan and such crap yeah. like, uh, from both sides. You could not, I could, I, I don't even know what real is anymore. And if you Google it, it's being curated by, by what they want you to see. And if you're going to search it on Facebook, it's going to be editorialized by what they want you to see. So the only way that you can really learn is to be involved, like to be there, to be part of the process. Like, have you volunteered? Like, if you're going to have a stance on Black Lives Matter, have you gone and volunteered in a, a poor socioeconomic area of the, an urban city? Have you gone to the police department and done, a, if you're like, no, defund the police, have you ever done a ride along with a police officer? Wow. Like, go give that a whirl. Yeah. Walk, walk one night in their shoes and, and then try to throw stones from your glass house of bullshit. Boom. Yeah. So like, I want every single American to be bought in on this idea of individual responsibility. Like you pick up the phone, you dial 911, especially in the times of defund the police, nobody's coming. So the only way that you're going to have your family be safe is if you can protect them. Totally. So you should be able to do that. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much yeah. again. I really appreciate it. America. We'll have to have you come back. Freedom.